the works, not only on the fusion of ideas of general perceptions, uh, what is common in in our social media or is common in the press and, and the media, that just to, to say that we have increasing a number of figures about uh, Amazon deforestation, that we are close to, to reach the non-return point. And then as uh, an amazing paper of the, the, uh, the work of Rafael Araujo and, and colleagues about the enchainment of the effects of deforestation, that is, uh, that is a progressive effect, that's not a non-linear effect of the, the deforestation on Amazon. I think that uh, it's an important idea. But now we are trying to discuss some, some important uh, questions about Amazon deforestation based on scientific works. Uh, the first one, uh, the first paper will be presented by Juliano Sunsal. Then, uh, but I asked uh, Juliano to spend five minutes uh, showing uh, some figures, three slides about what has happened in Amazon recently and some projections. And, and then after that, to discuss the, the fate of carbon, uh, the discussion about the uh, carbon market and Amazon deforestation. Uh, another subject of, uh, of the webinar is related to property rights. I think that we have a specialist here that is uh, Bastian Redon uh, from the Netherlands. And, but before him, uh, Alexandre Gorimaya and uh, João Paulo Capobianco, uh, Mastrangelo. <laughs> Capobianco is, is an activist, important activist. And uh, we will present the question about what if uh, entitling people is enough to, to impair Amazon deforestation. And uh, they, the paper of, of, uh, of is cited by the economist as, as a, uh, a relevant study about this. Buster Raiden is very important uh, and went to a very, <laughs> in some debates in, at the time of the, the government Bolsonaro, that was very <laughs> movable because the, some guys there, uh, or dangerous guys, I think. And then Buster Reda is, is, is a specialist for a long-term studies on, on uh, the question of property rights, not only in Amazon, but particularly in Amazon. The fact that the, 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 uh, the attribu attributing property rights in Amazon is a serious problem. And finally, Chavez, uh, Michel Chavez, uh, we'll present a question about uh, deforestation and agriculture. Um, okay, the, the effects, uh, some effects, uh, I, I think that some effects of uh, what Amazon deforestation caused on agriculture. That is important <laughs> remark, an important thing, because uh, part of, uh, of our landlord, landlords and uh, rural representatives that are very strong in the progress men, they are not uh, concerned about this. They have a short-term vision, and then part of their uh, results in agriculture could be uh, jeopardized by uh, this position. Okay, uh, I, I have to think to thank uh, to ICABR, International Consortium of uh, Applied Bioeconomy Research, uh, particularly uh, Justus Bessler, is, I think he is present in, in this webinar, uh, to Diego McCall. Diego McCall is fundamental to, to carry things in ICABR. I think that's a, a very important guy on this. Uh, and I, he received the, the precious help of Marina Migliasio, my intern. She uh, performed the first tests of the contact people and organized this webinar. So I will uh, get started with Juliano Sonson. I, I, I will give Juliano Sonson about 20 minutes, a little bit more than the other presenters, because he, he is going to present a, 
a general view about what's happened in Amazon. I think all of the speakers uh, have 50 minutes to present. And after the four presentations, we will open to questions, okay? Thank you all for coming. And, and Giuliano, take place, please. Thank you, Zamaria. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for an invitation, for the opportunity to uh, present this work. I apologize for um, most of my slides are in, Port are in Portuguese. I tried to translate as we were uh, uh, here discussing. I tried to translate a couple of those, but I, I, I failed to, to translate the rest of them. It's great to see so many familiar uh, faces here, people that I haven't seen for a while, like Bastian and a couple of others. João Paulo, I, I, I've been with him on, on this weekend in an amazing event in Belém. So it's really great to be here. Let me uh, project here, probably you guys can see. Let me put on presentation mode. Uh, it should be right, yeah. So what, what I prepared here is kind of a, the flip side uh, or the good side of deforestation, which is forest restoration, right? And, and this is based on a couple of works that we've been developing um, here at, at, at the Catholic University of Rio the department and in, in relationship with this uh, bigger project called Amazon 2030, which is a project uh, in which we, we uh, gather um, researchers from different fields uh, to look at the Amazon. And, and here I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna summarize some of the papers that I uh, we had around this topic. So I try to organize the, the question, the, the presentation uh, around a, a few key questions. The, the first one is what does does it mean to the Amazon itself, right? What, what forest restoration mean to the Amazon? And the starting point is this uh, very recent paper by Bernardo Flores and others, in which they show that the tipping point is actually uh, uh, happening and, and the, uh, you know, the threat to the integrity of the forest is something that is concrete. And it shows in this paper that a substantial fraction of the Amazon forest uh, under different scenarios can be exposed to degradation that could trigger a, a new equilibrium for the forest, right? It's not necessarily the fact that it's gonna be a, a savanna, but it can be uh, a quite different um, equilibrium in terms of the uh, the transition, and, and the risks are are, are there, right? And a, a related paper that Rosa Maria mentioned before, which is this paper with Rafael Araújo, Marini Rota, and José Schenkman, in which you managed to measure the so-called flying rivers based on uh, very detailed data on, on wind trajectories. And in this analysis, we can really measure um, the cycle that connects, you know, the humidity that is carried out from the Atlantic Sea through the atmospheric circulation process. And when these uh, wind trajectories, they, uh, they are transported uh, in forests, they become recharged. And then, uh, you know, the humidity goes deeper into the continent and with consequences to other parts of the forest. So uh, here you can really measure how degradation in one area of the Amazon can lead to degradation in other areas. So this is a paper in which you showed not only that deforestation and degradation in general has a propagating, important propagating effects, you know, down the wind into the other areas of the forest, but also, we can see that, you know, on the flip side, that if you restore the forest, because this analysis is pretty symmetric, if we restore the forest, we can reverse this project, taking benefits of this propagation, right? So I think this is a paper in which we got very excited about the possibility of being able to measure, uh, you know, uh, the so-called flying rivers. And here is our first application, in which we are looking at the impacts of um, forest degradation on the forest integrity itself, right? There we have some other projects in which we are measuring the impact of forest degradation on energy and also on agriculture in other parts of the of, of Brazil. So I, I think that you know when you 
when you uh, take into account these processes that are pretty much associated with the Amazon, with the integrity of the Amazon and the amount of biodiversity and, and, and the role that the, uh, the carbon stocks of the Amazon can have in terms of, of uh, challenging the, the climate crisis, I think, you know, uh, dealing with deforestation in the region and at the same time uh, thinking about ways of fostering forest restoration is quite critical. Right, so this is what uh, you know forest restoration would mean to the Amazon forest itself. And then we can uh, ask a, a, a connected question, which is about you know is there a possible trade-off between forest restoration and, and agricultural production? Right, this is something that you know uh, often comes into mind when you think about you know really uh, implementing forest restoration at scale, right, at a global scale. And my, uh, the figure that I like the most is this figure that is comp comp comprised by uh, FAO data, in which on the graph on your left, you'll see the evolution of agricultural production uh, from 1961 up to 2016. If you look at the more recent figures, they are uh, pretty much the, the same, but I just don't have the, the, uh, the, a, a nice figure as this one. And, and nothing, you know, very exciting has been uh, happening in agricultural production besides the fact that we managed to increase continuously uh, the agricultural production during this period, right? There is no real change on the graph on your left. But on the other hand, if we start to decompose how this um, agricultural expansion has been taking place, you'll see this uh, quite, uh, you know, inflection in 2001, in the sense that from 1961 up to 2001, the increase that you see on your left is uh, in place with a combination of area expansion and productivity gains, right? And from 2001 onwards, you observe the same pace of, you know, increasing agricultural production without increasing area. And actually, there's a reduction in the total area, according to the FAO data. So the idea of producing more in existing and cleared lands is much more than a, an abstraction or a theoretical possibility, something that is in place at the global scale for a couple of decades, right? So I think that's important because, you know, um, whenever, you think, whenever you think about, you know, uh, expanding these other activities and forest restoration as, uh, as one of them, you might be uh, concerned about food security or, or food price and things like that. And, and this picture shows that it's not necessarily the case because of the, uh, the history of occupation of these lands you know, uh, worldwide. And in Brazil, since the arrival of the Portuguese, I think we've been occupying the territory in a very extensive way, which creates this room for, at the same time, increasing the land use through intensification, expanding agricultural production, at the same time, releasing some area uh, for uh, these other kinds of activities. We ran in, in a, uh, another paper, we ran this scenario in which uh, we consider, you know, nowadays in the Amazon we have more than 80, 80, million, 80 million hectares of deforested area in the illegal Amazon in Brazil. And most of it is occupied by pastures, right? If you implement on, on in these areas some some practices that are very easy and very uh, available, like you know uh, a, a basic uh, pasture management and practice, this would in, even considering the, the projected increase in agricultural production, this would uh, impose a, a reduction in the pasture land and releasing something like, you know, more than 37 million hectares. So this is a, a lot of room, you know, to implement, no, no worries, yeah. So what, 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 what we can see from that is that, you know, uh, we can have a, a you know, uh, you can implement yeah. the forest restoration at scale without necessarily uh, affecting the food production if we manage to uh, allocate our resources in a more productive way. So there is room for that at scale in the role, there is room for that at scale in the Amazon, right? So uh, let me turn to the potential of the forest restoration in Amazon 
before going to this specific uh, paper that uh, Jose Maria was mentioned before. And the potential forest rest restoration in the Amazon can be uh, seen in different ways, right? We can start looking at, you know, uh, the data on forest restoration through natural regeneration that is in place in the, in, in the region, right? And here on your left, you'll find the data from the Mapiomas, which is a very good data set on the Amazon that they classify satellite imagery automatically, and they've been able to identify more than 10 million hectares of secondary vegetation in the Amazon. Uh, this is, uh, these are areas in which, uh, you know, the forest was cut, and now it, they probably were, uh, those areas were abandoned, and they are, and the forest is coming back, right? And they're in different stages. On your right, you'll find a, a, a different paper um, made by people from the Amazon, which they, you know, they designed specific, uh, they did a specific analysis in order to really identify uh, those areas of secondary vegetation. What they found is that, you know, from that 84 million hectares in the, in the region, you know, we have more than 60 million hectares in terms of, uh, of pastures and 7 million hectares of a kind of a, a long run forest restoration. I mean, um, forest restoration that is in place for more than six years, right? So have 7 million hectares uh, of areas that are more advanced on the uh, restoration and uh, 8 million hectares that is abandoned and in some form, but below six years. So we don't know if this is part of the rotation of the cultural process or <laughs> so uh, so that's uh, this shows you know uh, that I think that if, if you have the interpretation that the the uh, the glasses have full it shows there's a lot of potential for forest restoration in Brazil but you can show as well that the the, the half is, uh, the, the glasses have empty in the sense that we cut those trees the deforestation is not serving too much of a production because after the forest, these areas have been abandoned at scale and the forest is coming back, right? So you have the both, the both ways. So um, there, there is a, I'm involved in two other papers that show the same, the same message, which is the fact that once you impose, uh, once you reduce the pressure of deforestation and you can do this through the monitoring, you know, uh, command and control policies, when we implement the command and control policy, reduce the, the pressure on deforestation and you foster uh, forest regeneration. We can see that, you know, in a detailed way using the command and control policies. Uh, and this is the paper in which uh, we do that, that exercise. Mm -hmm. And also we can see a similar result that we captured in another paper uh, that is the, um, and this one you need to look at at the property level uh, those properties that, that were uh, uh, caught in, into illegal uh, activities, illegal deforestation, what we see is that deforestation and forest restoration uh, increase in the following years, not only in that specific property, but also in, 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 in the nearby regions, right? So uh, the thing is that, you know, whenever you reduce the pressure on deforestation in the Amazon, you get as a collateral effect these incentives for uh, forest restoration and the, the, the dynamics, the ecological uh, properties of the forest and the conditions of the Amazon are such that you know, are very favorable for uh, for this uh, to happen. So, um, based on that, we can we can ask ourselves, okay, that's the forest restoration, this whole potential in the Amazon, and and also. Uh, you know, nowadays, more recently, we got this attention to forest restoration agenda through the climate lens, right? So we can uh, start by uh, looking at how climate interacts with the Amazon, right? So uh, let me give you some figures about the, uh, the state of climate in the world. The global emissions of CO2 equivalent, considering the whole, the whole uh, emissions is more than 50 gigatons per year, right? And there is this paper that I hope it's wrong, but there is this paper that shows that the carbon budget to control the risk of setting up a scenario of 1.5, 1.72 degrees um, is that you know the, the carbon budget, if you take two degrees, which is a 
not so comfortable scenario for the climate, uh, considering 2020 at this, you know, uh, rhythm of emissions, we'll have something like 16 years. Or so we are talking about, you know, 2036 or so to uh, to surpass that budget if we keep the pace of emissions. And there is no sign that this will change dramatically, right? There is only some hopes that this will happen. So whenever you think about these numbers, I think the con one conclusion is clear, which is, the, which is the conclusion that it's not only, this agenda is not only about transitioning to a low carbon economy. We will need to implement ways of capturing carbon from the atmosphere at scale. And there is nothing, you know, now there is nothing better than uh, forest restoration in order to do so. And there's this other paper here, which I hope it's right, that shows that the potential of carbon capture in the so-called nature-based solutions in which forest restoration is the uh, most important one is around three to, to 10 gigatons per year. So we're talking about a huge, a, a huge uh, uh, potential there. So uh, the, if you look at the, the carbon price, which is a kind of a measure of how the world is, is, is paying attention to this problem and implementing different policies that are trying to mitigate the risks of climate change, we'll see that there are many countries that are operating and implementing policies that are valuing carbon at very high prices, right? And then let, I'm gonna emphasize in, the, in Europe, the ETS market is, is transactioning around uh, $87 per ton. And I'll come back to this number in a, in a second. But my point is just to, to show that, you know, many countries are moving that direction. And this is more or less the prices in which these things are happening in those countries, right? If you look at the, in the Amazon, and I really like this, this graph here, you know, in this graph, we're showing in log scales the GDP per capita on the axis and, and emissions per capita on the vertical axis. And what you'll see is that the Amazon in this scenario is, a, is, a, is quite an outlier in a sense that it's producing much more emissions um, given the amount of you know, wealth and income, in, you know, the economic activity of the region, right? And considering this is a log scale, this difference here, Amazon is 10 times what it, it would supposed to be if if it was you know going to be you know around the other countries in the same in the same area. So there is a lot of so the Amazon in the sense of the uh, the carbon prices, the Amazon is is not contributing for the solution. On the other hand, it's on the opposite. Amazon is pretty much you know contributing to make the problem even worse, right? So uh, in this paper. And that I, I'd like to, to, to you know, uh, spend you know, two or three minutes on it to finish. In this paper, we try to, to uh, study a very simple mechanism, which is a mechanism in which uh, the Amazon gets payments for the service of capturing carbon from the atmosphere through uh, natural forest regeneration. Right. So the mechanism that we study is a very simple one. It's a jurisdictional in the sense that you know. In the every year, we, we, we would compute the amount of carbon that is captured on a net basis in the Amazon biome, and, and this amount of carbon will be the amount of carbon that is captured through forest restoration minus what is emitted through deforestation, right? And if you get paid by a given amount or uh, per ton, we study what would be the optimal location of resources in the region considering that you know for every part of the amazon we have a potential in terms of forest restoration and we have a potential in terms of uh, uh cattle ranching because we use data detailed data from the agriculture census on the on the cattle ranching revenue we don't consider the profits we consider the revenue which is, which i we think it's it's more conservative and, and at, at the same time it's more uh adequate here so uh, for each region, the Amazon, you know, we, we divide the Amazon in, in different, you know, there's a small site here. For each site, we have a potential in terms of carbon capture. We we'll, we'll have a potential of in terms of the uh, of the cattle ranching. 
And then we will see, uh, we consider different carbon price scenarios uh, based on international transfers and, and, and look at what would be, from a social planner point of view, what would be the optimal location of the region. And, and the idea is to consider, you know, given that now the world is uh, uh, concerned about climate change and the carbon price is a representation of that concern, how we would think about the optimal allocation of, of, uh, of resources in the Amazon, considering that this new scenario, right? So we study, uh, you know, a scenario in which the, the world uh, pays us $20 per ton of carbon capture. Notice that $20 is much less than the $90 that uh, you observe in the, in the European market, right? So you'll see um, that, you know, with $20, we would, you know, there is, the cattle ranching that could face the revenue income of $20 per ton of carbon is very in a very restricted area in the Amazon, right? If we face the opportunity of, you know, getting paid for the service of, of, carbon, of carbon capturing uh, through forest restoration, in considering, you know, natural regeneration, this would induce a land use change. And then the Amazon will... Uh, Instead of being, you know, a net emitter, which is nowadays, it will start, you know, capturing carbon at scale. And in 30 years, this has potential of capturing 16 gigatons of carbon, which, you know, at $20, we are talking about $320 billion in 30 years. It's a lot of money. That's the trajectory that we, we simulate here. We will have a, a peak uh, in 10 years of about $15 billion. So... Um, the whole thing here is that the the carbon can really change the fate of the Amazon in the sense that once you get you, you internalize the carbon price, uh, you would imagine a, an Amazon 30 years from now in which the cattle ranching activity will be restricted to areas in which is really uh, uh, productive. The population will be uh, concentrated in, in urban areas, which already uh, account for more than 75% of the total population, and you'll be and you'll observe in the rest uh, of the area, you know, uh, this massive forest restoration, which will be compatible with, you know, the kinds of activities like, you know, the bioeconomy and other uh, uh, um, and products that that would uh, grow in compatible with the forest, right? So that's the vision that we have with the Amazon, and this paper shows, you know. Uh, this makes a lot of sense in terms of the uh, the economics of it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Sorry, I think I... I... Uh, thank you, Giuliano. Uh, I think that you provide a, a huge inspiration for practical actions, what is important. And when your message says that it's a combination between command and control and you have uh, sound data about what what would be the possibilities i think that your work is is very close to the work of maximo torero if you know him about uh, reduction of poverty in, in africa and in other countries this could be, there is a lot of similarities and then i don't know i think that the icbr will be uh, a lot of pleasure to, to 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 have a presentation this presentation in our webinar i will Pass to Alexandre Gori and John Paolo um, for uh, 50 minutes. Sorry, but I, I arranged that uh, Giuliano spent part of his presentation showing some figures. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jose Maria. It's really a pleasure to be here with a lot of old friends. Uh, first, I will give the, the screen to my colleague, John Paulo, who will make an introduction, and, and then I will come back with the boring part, which, which, which is the economics. John Paulo, please go ahead. Hi, hello. Uh, I think that uh, Gori asked you to present. Sim, Gori, Gori, Gori vai apresentar. Disprezit. Okay, so Gori, let's go. You, your time is running. Uh, João Paulo, don't you want don't you want to, to present the introduction? 
Nobody. No. Okay. okay. You would rather you present this. <laughs> but okay. uh, so I, I, I stress I that the, the, the main guy here is John Paul that works. Yeah, for sure. I'm <laughs> John Paul is the only one that understand, really understands about the forestation. A little bit shy. Yeah, for sure. Uh, anyway, so I presented this paper that we, is the is part of the, the thesis of this dissertation of from Paulo Mastrangelo. Uh, he finished last year. Uh, the first in, we we had two two parts. In the first part, we analyzed the impact of land security on on on, on deforestation, and in the second part that I present uh, today, uh, we analyzed the impact of uh, individual land site planning on deforestation. Uh, what, are, what, what are the impacts of giving a land site planning for a, 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 a land owner? So, uh, João Paulo can, can complement my presentation here. So, I, 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 I will try to talk to uh, Juliano, gave you a, a really shiny presentation here. It, it, it's, it's interesting to say more about the, the, the deforestation in the Amazon. So, uh, uh, just just to highlight you know, that, that one of the main policies from the Brazilian government in the last two years uh, trying to control the kind of command and control policy, not the kind of command and control, I think it is different, it's a kind of uh, 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 property rights. Uh, you can give uh, land titling for, 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 for the land owners and in the expecting that they can invest in the property in, in this kind of investment, they can uh, curb deforestation that are mainly practiced, practiced on, on private lands and public lands. So we, we again, we, we try to analyze the impact of two variables. Uh, the first is land title, title. We use a unique data set from the ACME. Uh, uh, John Fowler is, uh, did a, a, a really great job tweaking this data. And, 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 and he was the secretary of environment in Africa when, when they collected this data from the car uh, in, in Brazil. And, and the state of Africa also asked for the land owners to provide information on land, land titling. So we, we have a, a really good data set. I think it's one of the main contributions of this study. <laughs> a good data set. Every nice research starts with a good data. Good, good, good data. So the first variable is land title. If the, the land owner has the land title, individual land title, I try to explain what is the land title. Joel tried to explain me for four years, but I didn't understand very well. So I'm sorry if you don't understand. John Paul can help me. And the second variable, variable is land security. Uh, land security is, is a more uh, related to institutions. Uh, if uh, someone that has the land title, title uh, uh, if uh, the, 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 the law can be really enforced. For example, I have the land title, so I can, the, the government can guarantee that no one else will come to my land and, and say that, okay, this land is mine, it's not yours. So uh, we try to use a proxy for our land security and try to check how these two variables can affect deforestation using individual uh, 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 individual level data. Uh, so uh, this is the theoretical background of our of our presentation. We have land titling, uh, uh, which is made mediated by land security with the institute, institution, government, one locality. Uh, we are in this presentation we focus on the impact of land title uh, on deforestation. So land security is a mediator. We will compare uh, how land title uh, impacts deforestation in, in areas uh, with land security and in areas uh, without or with land insecurity. We can compare. We, we will show. I will. <laughs> Uh, show, we will show that land title is important only when you have land security, basically. So, of course, we have a lot of compounding factors that we try to, to control in our study. I will not focus on variables, which is very boring, I know, but you are invited to, to read our preliminary papers. And we have also other moderators that we analyze in this study. We are using, uh, thanks to João Paulo, a data set from ASPE. Uh, we have 35 a thousand uh, rural properties in, in Acre. We are not, in this study, we, we restricted our analysis to a, a subsample of 
Uh, is almost population is not a sample. Thirty-five thousand uh, is all almost all properties in 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 in, in Acre are registered as car. So uh, we filter the data for uh, rural settlements from the Brazilian National Institute of Rural uh, Rural Reform Land Reform, uh, INCRA. Uh, so because we want to compare properties that are really comparable, uh, for example. If someone has a land title, I cannot only compare those with land title and those with, without land title. For sure, we will have a lot of selectivity in this comparison because probably that those that have land title already the forest, how the, the, the forest they had. Okay, now the, the area is mine. It's the one of the first things that you can show to, to claim a land, land title is to, to deforest everything and say, okay, I'm using for, for an economic activity. So uh, uh, I, I mean, we're casting a lady title for this uh, particular land. Bastian can correct me after because Bastian also knows a lot about that. So uh, we are analyzing only the stage of Acre. Uh, this is a, a graph showing uh, how deforestation is, uh, uh, the, share, the share of total deforestation that is in uh, conservation units, uh, in private properties, and, and, and settlement projects that we are analyzing is the dark yellow that we are analyzing in, in settlement uh, properties. I think this is a kind of one third of the deforestation in, in rural settlements. And, and so most of the deforestation are in private lands, as we can see. So this highlights the importance of this study. Uh, this is our, our, our case for the study. Uh, we filter, we are comparing uh, 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 rural settlements uh, which uh, receive the land title in our period of analysis, which is between 2008 and 2018. We have data only for this period. Uh, and we are comparing this treatment group with, with a comparison group with some, some, some uh, rural settlements that didn't receive the land title yet. So in this period between uh, 2008 and 2018, our comparison group never received the, the treatment, never received the land title. Uh, we, we can believe, we believe <laughs> that they are uh, comparable because uh, they have, uh, we, we, we selected only the, the comparison group which, which had a preliminary document, a concession contract. João Paulo could explain better what is that, but it's a kind of a preliminary document that you must have in order to ask for a, a formal land title in the future. So we are, we, are, we are comparing those with land title and those with this preliminary document. So we have more comparable groups. We have nearly uh, 20, uh, 2,800 properties in each group. So 2,000. 2,000 property in each group that we are comparing. We can see that they are especially uh, random. Uh, we don't have, have any kind of selection in terms of this spatial location in our comparison and, and, and treatment groups. Uh, this is the period that we are analyzing. You can see, as Juliano highlights, that the forestation has different trends over the, 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 the time. And of course, uh, we, we are not sure that this, that we, or the results we had for this period can, can be replicated for other periods uh, because we are analyzing a period where, where, where the forestation was lower than in other periods. The forestation started growing again in the end of 2018 for reasons that you must know better than, than me. Uh, we use three dependent variables. We, we try to make a, a robust net robustness check using different outcomes. We use the hyperbolic sign uh, conversion, which is a, a conversion to, to take in consideration that we have a lot of zero deforestation each year. Uh, we have a binary that uh, assumed one when we had deforestation in that property in a specific year. We have also the share of the forest area. Uh, our strategy, this is the important part, to not waste my time in here. Uh, we are using the uh, famous uh, dynamic difference in difference, difference in difference estimator proposed by Kalawai and Santana, uh, which is called also as the Stagger regression. We then also show our results that I, I saw that they used also this same strategy. 
the one of the main advantages of this strategy is that we can analyze the ATT, the average of intrusive effect, effect on the intrusive over time. So after uh, the, uh, when we compare the, those properties who uh, uh, receive and who, and who did not receive over the time, you can see the, the impacts of land cycling in one, two, three uh, years and so on. Uh, so this is our, I, I don't know if I'm going so fast, Zé Maria, I'm fine with the time here, I think so. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you have, you have uh... Okay, João Paulo can complement my presentation in, in the final. So we, we did a lot of uh, sensitivity analysis here. Uh, we try to, to, to use different models uh, using uh, different specifications. Uh, we try four specifications. These four models are nested models. What are nested models? For example, in the first model, we didn't control for our confounders. We just compare uh, the impacts of land cycling on the forestation on the three dependent variables. We have three columns here, each one or one of our dependent variable, variables, how they are related to deforestation. When we don't control for any confounders, we can see, okay, uh, land cycling seems to reduce deforestation. We have negative and significant impacts using the three uh, dependent variables. Then in the next model, second line, panel B, we added controls for uh, uh, property characteristics for example, uh, how easy it is to access the nearby municipality, uh, the geographic location, the land size, and so on. Uh, even when we control for our property characteristics, we still have a negative impact of land cycling on deforestation. So for why the results are good. Then we start controlling for municipality characteristics, uh, uh, for example, uh, cattle herds, the average price of uh, uh, in the municipality, and even controlling for these variables, we still have mostly, only with the exception of the final variable, variable, we mostly have significant estimates. So land cycling still has negative impact on uh, reduced deforestation. But when we control for land security, using a proxy giving for, I didn't explain this very well, but I'm sorry. Uh, we use a proxy giving for the overlapping uh, of property rights. For example, two people claiming that they are the owner of the same land. So everybody uh, is mandatory to register the area that they have uh, of their property in the car. And we use each geographic localization for each property we compare if we had overlapping between these properties in the same municipality, we compute, compute the share of properties with overlapping in each municipality. When we control for this proxy for land security, we have the mostly insignificant estimates. So our, uh, our impacts of land cycling on, on, on deforestation is gone. Uh, I think this is the main result. So I will try to, to highlight other simulations that we did here, but our main results for while is that, okay, land cycling uh, does not have the effect on, on deforestation also we control for land security. So in properties that are subjected to the same level of land security, land cycling will not solve the problem, will not make the, the land owner to reduce deforestation. Uh, this is uh, the evolution of the impacts over time in the red bars we have after the, the, the settlement uh, the properties received the title in the blue before they received the title we can see that the results are mostly negative and uh, this sorry mostly insignificant over time it means that uh land cycling will not have the impacts over time uh, in the short or in the long term we only have an exception here for some variables for the two final years this is something that we are still trying to understand because this is uh, showing us that those properties that received the land title in 2008, 2009 uh, are more prone to reduce deforestation in the longer run. Uh, we, we are trying to understand these results. Yeah. 
but the results are mostly insignificant for the variables, dependent variables we have here over time. And this is also uh, uh, heterogeneous effects that we analyze it. We split the sample in two groups. Uh, those properties that are in municipalities with length security, we define a, a cutoff for our length security. I don't remember exactly from how can uh, recover it. Uh, so in, 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 in properties that are in, in municipalities with the, a lot of uh, a, a really sh a small number of properties with overlapping, we define this uh, weak length security and those properties that are in municipalities with a yeah, really high number of overlapping, we put these municipalities, these uh, properties in the group of land uh, insecurity or without land security. We can see here that we, we have negative impacts of, of land titling only in the first group on the left, which are the properties that are in municipalities with land insecurity. But in the second group, properties that are municipalities with land security, a lot of overlapping people claiming that are the owners of the same piece of land. Uh, the impact of land cycling is mostly insignificant. And, and then this is a conclusion. Uh, our main result is that uh, land titling can work uh, only if you have land security. Uh, in places that we don't have land security, Lane tightening has insignificant. We, did, we didn't find evidence that lane tightening can reduce deforestation in localities without uh, lane security. I mean, really sorry if I was, was too fast. And uh, Tom Paulo, please, uh, you can make some final comments if you want. Feel free. Thank you, Tom No, no, no. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Gordy. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Jose Maria, but uh, I don't speak English. So... <laughs> Desculpa. No problem, João. You did a really great job, and we are still working these papers. Any recommended suggestion here will be more than welcome. Thank you again, Jose Maria, and my colleagues here. Maria, we cannot listen to you. I think your microphone is off. Sorry. Let's go. I was speaking a lot, but without effect. Uh, thank you. I think that both presentations converted the importance to combine policies, that only isolated policies are not enough. Um, the concept, I think the concept of tenure security is a concept that demands um, um, as social action but even the the government government action so it's important to, for a reflection Boston Reno please I go to your presentation now <clears throat> okay uh, good night to, to all here it's night sorry for that uh, yeah Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, just to for you to know, I, I was uh, a professor at, at Unicamp for many years. Now I'm five years here at, uh, at Cadastre and have been working in different universities around here, but mostly directly with with land issues in different countries like Colombia, Peru, Mozambique, and surely in Brazil also. Uh, I will pass this part. I just want, this is something that I always showed, mostly uh, outside of Brazil. People don't, don't always know that Brazil has such a, an important uh, agriculture and, and so for them to understand what is the problem. But we th I think we have, when we talk about deforestation and all that, we still have to think about, uh, we are still in the same 
old process eh, of getting the, the, the forest, cutting the trees, cutting uh, what is good, uh, what is good uh, timber goes to the industry, what is bad is, is burned, and then you put cattle just to assure ownership of land. <coughs> Sorry for that. And then later on, you come to agriculture. So because of this process and because of the lack of good land governance in the country, we have such a system with very big properties like you don't see anywhere else. Uh, just for for you to think, uh, the Netherlands uh, is is uh, can uh, can fit into Brazil 275 times, and the Netherlands is the biggest producer agriculture producer in the world. So uh, the the issue that I saw Juliano just showing it's 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 true. We don't need more land. That is the main idea. So m my main vision is that. Uh, I also like to show this. We still have conflicts around land. And with all this land, 855 million of hectares, and we're still having people dying and, and fighting for land. And the uh, deforestation went very much down in the seventh, in the beginning of, of the 2000s because of command and control policies. It stayed more or less stable. Then Bolsonaro came in and it rised again. And now it's more or less stable. But uh, surely, only command and control policies are not enough. So what, what are the main causes of deforestation? This is something that we really have to think about. So it's always, I like this one because uh, uh, it's, it's a study from, uh, no, I can't remember his name now. Later on, I will come to it. So it's always association between land use, so agriculture prices, land prices, input prices, timber prices, policies. And so always when we have cheap credit or we have fiscal incentives, uh, the, the deforestation will increase. Accessibility. So when you have highways or other projects that facilitates access to, to the areas, you will have more deforestation. And surely the microeconomics, the cycles of GDP, the population. And or the the issue that I've been studying mostly is the grabbing and speculation with land, because for me, that is the biggest reason for uh, uh, for for the deforestation. Uh, this is some studies from from Ipan that are very good, uh, showing okay where does most deforestation occur in in, in the Amazon. So. We can see here that indigenous land is very little, uh, uh, conservation units is very little, environmental is very little. Okay, where we come to higher rural settlements. So to discuss a little bit the, the issue that came out at Jean Paulus and, and Gori study, uh, what were those new uh, properties titles given? I think that's very important for us to understand better their conclusions. But for me, important is Again, 21% is private property. So yeah, private properties are, but we still don't know if this is legal or illegal at deforestation on, on private properties. And that's also something that from your study, we don't know. But for me, very important is are those. Huh? So we have 36%, 37% that are all from federal public lands. Uh, before we had also state public lands and no information. So, yeah, I, we could make an association with what Gwari said, that areas where you don't have clear uh, property rights or where it's insecure, the property rights, they are more, um, yeah, uh, in risk of, of deforestation. So, <clears throat> uh, my main, uh, what I really want to show, he, here again, we can see that Terras públicas não destinadas have a lot, have a lot of deforestation. So, as policy, I think that uh, besides command and control that we need mostly for the for the private properties because they are only allowed to deforestate 20% of their area. So those numbers that came out from uh, 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 João Paulo and Gori, I don't know if what, what is does it mean. But so yeah, but I am always saying that look. Uh, the, the biggest issue is, is the, the governmental land. So this is, as we don't know what the total area of the country is, we, we used 
the, the car and the CGF, and the CGF is the cadaster that exists in, in INCRA, uh, to, 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 to start uh, having some numbers. So th those numbers, it's a publication we, we did, 2019, we are uh, going to have this uh, done again because this is with data from 2017 and we wanted to have it for 2021 or 22. <laughs> but here we see uh, already that using uh, satellite uh, information, satellite images and, no, satellite need, uh, um, yeah, satellite and the, the car that are georeferenced by the people themselves and the CGF that are, let's say, uh, uh, geo-specialized geo uh, with the supervision of the government, let's say. So those are official numbers. I could go into that, but I don't have time. Where I want to come is to this. So from this, we get that we have 54 uh, uh, million hectares uh, uh, of undesignated land and 141 million hectares of uh, unregistered land. Those numbers, are, I think, are a bit, uh, um, uh, let's say, they, they are a bit high. Eh? If you see other studies from IPA, from other people, they are talking about 70, 70 millions of hectares that are not, where we don't know the, the, the ownership. So from my point of view, so besides command and, command and control, we need to map those lands, see where they are, and register them. Uh, and then, like uh, Terra Legal did uh, in the years to beginning of the years 2000, it was very important. Why do I say that? Because the land, the, the land grabbing of this kind of land, so that is land that uh, nobody really knows from who it is, is the main reason for a big part of the deforestation. And why does that happen? Yeah, surely, because uh, if you have forest land and, and you have pasture land, the, the difference in, in price is so high. There, there are not so many investments that can give this return. So grab land, get, obtain the registration of it in some way, uh, and, and then uh, deforestating it, is, it's a big business. So that's what we have to, to fight with. And where does this problem come from? So th this was where, when I came to the Netherlands the first time, I wanted to understand what happens. Why is that problem like that in Brazil? And I could see it when I started to study land administration. And, and, and I'm here at the Cadaster, that is the, the main institution that works with land administration in the Netherlands, and we work all under uh, other countries. But the, the big problem in Brazil is that we have a very fragmented institutional setting. So we have the notaries where property notaries, cartores registro imóveis, they register, but they don't map it, so they know where they don't know where it is. So it's quite easy to 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 have a fraudulent registration of, of properties. Eh? And then you have INCRA that makes the maps and all that uh, of, of, of all land. INCRA does other things. You have the, the, the Receita Federal High Income Tax Office that is charging the property tax, but uh, they're not doing it in reality or very little, but some municipalities are doing it. So this whole setting, eh? so then you have, when I'm talking about state, uh, state owned land, or that all comes from the, from the Terra de Voluta, it's all Terra de Voluta from the, from the Leite Terras from 1850 of Brazil. So those, so those, I don't know, 70 million hectares of hundred million hectares, whatever we are talking about, 70 million or, 100 million hectares, they are from uh, state governments. They have to, to be in charge of that. So uh, ITERPA, uh, ITESP, uh, all those, ITERACRI, but ACRI doesn't have much of this land for other reasons. But you, at the same time, you have a lot of the land that has to be uh, 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 administrated by INCRA or before by Terra Legal. That was one part, but there's still more terra de voluta that we don't even know. So the whole issue of governmental land is something that we have to face. To do that, we have to have a good cadaster. We did big steps last years, uh, but we still need to do more. Those are examples. Uh, we don't have this vision in Brazil yet. Huh? This, this is for me the main uh, 
the most important aim that I want to achieve before I, I go away from this uh, earth. So you have to have a good cadaster with identification of land par parcels, register and maps. So th th you have to have that to start because otherwise all the rest doesn't work. So you can't establish land use, you can't establish how you will develop if you don't have a good cadaster. And you can't have secure uh, legal rights if you don't have this. So this is for me the, the, the first step. And so yeah, there is a lot of literature that I could cite. There is, I don't know how my time is, Zé Maria, you tell me. Uh, surely the, the uh, this is, a, I, I like very much this study that shows that how uh, uh, institutions, what the role that institutions pay, the political economy pay on, on, on land management decision and conservation of land. Uh, this is this is very important. I just want, if you have, if I have some uh, minutes still, just to talk a little bit about about the the Netherlands. Just nobody wants to 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 uh, have the Dutch model all around the world, but it's just something that we can see that it's possible. So there are two laws to organize all the territory. The cadaster, the Dutch cadaster, does the registration, the record, and the mapping. So all what what IBGE does in some way, all what all cartorios in Brazil do in some way. So we're talking about five uh, thousand cartorios, and all what the municipalities do. That's all done by one organization. So we do we do land registration. We have the key registers. We do we have the national geodetic reference network. It's something that we haven't solved in Brazil. IBGE should do this, but it doesn't do. We here the Netherlands they even have the cables and pipelines map, eh? and and some other issues that are very important. So it's all linked, all information is linked, and it all started with the cadaster, with the maps, and the register of properties. And from this, all other information is is linked. So people give information to the government once, and even property values are here. Why? Because if you register, because in Brazil when you register. <laughs> A trade of land, you don't put the right uh, value on it. Why now? Because you will pay too much uh, uh, trade uh, tax. But here not. Here you put the right value, and this value is then, with other models, used to value the property. And with that, you are going to tax or to do everything. But it's a value that I know publicly. Everybody knows what is the value of my property. So uh, uh, it's an issue of conception and how to do. So we, as Cadastro International, we we work in many countries, helping and uh, uh, yeah, trying to find solutions together with them. And we don't have the solution, huh? the, the, the Cadastro, the Dutch Cadastro, but but we have where to go after the solutions. Huh? And there are, huh? there is a whole uh, uh, institutional international setting. So we developed something called the Fit for Purpose Land Administration. That is something that is very important, makes it much simpler to to do this. What I'm talking about, so uh, putting the right, uh, mapping the land and knowing who, who owns and who is responsible for it to, to diminish uh, the l land uh, uh, deforestation. So uh, yeah, I will stop here. We have projects in Colombia, in Brazil, in, in, uh, in many countries. Uh, I think we have an idea of, of what I think is important. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to say that this study that was possible to do, João Paulo, I'm saying now, it's because he was as responsible for the car in Acre. He did something that nobody did, and we tried to do that nationally at the time, to use the car as an instrument also for land. Uh, for, to, to at least make a an, an, an link with land ownership. But the people of the environmental... Uh, didn't want that, but he he put in the questionnaire also who owns and what kind of title he has. So for, from that was very important for to do this study, and this is unique eh, in Brazil. So there we know a lot of things. This study that they did, uh, I think, is very important. But many other studies can come out of that experience in Acre, thanks to João Paulo. That doesn't speak English still. When he came, I said, "You have to learn English." <laughs> Yeah, this is important.
thank you, Boston. It's an amazing presentation because it complements a lot of the other two. You, we are very happy to, to, to present three different uh, presentations with convergent views based on reality, based on data, but uh, simultaneously based on the, uh, the vision that you to, to carry on some actions, you need institutional uh, redesign a new mechanism to, to, to achieve. Uh, so please, uh, Michel, uh, the last presentation, but, but not less important. <laughs> Michel Chavez, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I think that we, with this, we... You can see my presentation? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, uh, a special acknowledgments to the ICABR uh, for the invitation, for the presentation of this analysis, which uh, refers to a paper published in the Perspectives in Ecology and Conservation, PECOM, about the interesting region in Brazil uh, presented before. Uh, a macro, the newer Amazonia deforestation hotspot, and the potential setback for Brazilian agriculture. My name is Michel Chaves. Uh, I'm a geographer uh, from the Federal University of Alfenas, Minas Gerais, specialist in planning and management of protected natural areas, if Sudest MG. And Master of Science and PhD in Agricultural Engineering at UFLA, postdoc in remote sensing from INPE, working with land use change monitoring. And currently, I'm an assistant professor in the, the research area of geosciences in the uh, São Paulo State University, UNESP, Campus Tupan, São Paulo. Well, this study. Uh, uh, refers to uh, Brazilian agrivironmental potential. Uh, Brazil's, uh, Brazil ha uh, has a great uh, agricultural and environmental potential, which refers to these conditions to be a, a protagonist in providing ecosystem services and food. Um, a macro is a project uh, for sustainable development zone in the Amazon region especially uh, in the confluence between uh, among Amazonas, Acre, and Rondônia. We will uh, approach this, this analysis on this, including political and technical issues, forest degradation, deforestation, and land use conversion. We uh, uh, observe the analysis from these four, four axes, political and technical issues, forest degradation, deforestation, and land use conversion. After I'm talking about the implications of the creation of the zone for uh, the agricultural sector, especially in the question of the setback for agricultural production related to rains and adaptoclimatic conditions, in concluding remarks about policies about uh, the conditions, or economic conditions, socioeconomic conditions in the Amazon. Well, Brazil has uh, enormous agroenvironmental potential, the conditions, exceptional conditions to be a protagonist in providing ecosystem services and food, and is a key player in combating climate change related vulnerabilities, environmental, economic, and social vulnerabilities. And, and at least two attributes support this condition divest biodiversity, which generates global benefits and is a reserve for biotechnological development. And they structured and productive agricultural chain, which is characterized by high yield capacity, especially when, when we working, when we analyzing the grain production, soybean, maize production in Brazil. Consequently, Agroenvironmental policies should focus on innovative economic development models following sustainable principles. Sustainability principles, not ephemeral sustainable, sustainability principles, but exact sustainable principles. 
However, deforestation, especially deforestation in the Brazilian legal Amazon, opposed these principles. And is a problem. It is a problem for Brazil, generating sanctions, uh, the, the question about the climate, and uh, uh, tools related to Brazil stalking in global conferences. Well, the project for the, the creation of the, the macro, the Abunan Madeira Sustainable Development Zone, is a project discussion since 2012, 2028 uh, in the Amazonian version of the Matopiba Agricultural Frontier. They, they, they planned this, this region to be an Amazonian version of the Matopiba Agricultural Frontier, which is a forefront of the agricultural expansion in Brazil, in the Cerrado Bayon. This is an initiative from state governments, from Amazonas, Acre, and Rondônia, which is technical cooperation for the superintendents for the Amazon development, Sudan, the Manaus Free Trade Zone Superintendent, Suframa, and the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, the Research Unit Territorial, Embrapa Territorial. This region, uh, the, the planned region to, to uh, embrace the macro, has 454 square kilometers of area, 1.7 million inhabitants, uh, 32 municipalities that accounts for 23% of this state's total area, a total of uh, 86 conservation units, 49 uh, indigenous lands and 94 square kilometers of non-designation, non-designated, undesignated public forests. However, uh, despite these numbers, 76% uh, of the total deforestation rate in Amazonas, Acre, and Rondonia uh, from 28 to 2022, uh, data from INPE deforestation data from produce, from produce in well, it, well, what emerges in this region? A deforestation hotspot, deforestation hotspot in a region planned for agro-livestock, agro agro-livestock development in the Amazon rainforest. When, where, when we observe the data, we can analyze that deforestation are increasing in all land tenure classes, especially after the project became widespread in 2028, with forest loss increasing in protected areas, including after this day, and except in indigenous lands, which were used as a protective shields. However, uh, analyzing the, the manuscripts, analyzing the, the data, the, the political data, working in a political analysis in the documentation of the to create the zone, we observed that environmental impact studies and public policies regarding its implementation and protection of local, local population are still lacking. There are enormous lacks in environmental impact studies and public policies regarding the protection of local traditional population. When this, in this scenario, with a weakening of uh, environmental policies and weakening of uh, fiscalization of uh, embargoes from IBAMA, embargoes from the political uh, and, and technical uh, agencies in Brazil, we can observe some problems, some issues raising in this region. An example of uh, degradation, forest degradation. Forest degradation is a threat to, to extending forests that is increasing in this region. In this figure, we can observe with, uh, uh, after a crucial wall's analysis that forest degradation increased more inside the sustainable development zone, the, the municipalities, the, the 32 uh, uh, municipalities of Amacro, after the announcement. The total of non-disturbed forests decreased on a higher pace in the municipalities planned to compose the SDZ, and consequently, the forest degradation increased more inside and after the announcement. 
In all land classes, in all land tenure classes, we can observe this phenomena, despite the boom after the, the creation that the, the project became widespread. Speculation uh, is a factor that caused the expansion of the, the, the numbers, the boom of deforestation in this region, per land tenure classes, um, which is poorly related with uh, the contextual policies and environmental and weakening of environmental and different analysis in Brazil related to economic crisis, changes in political forces, the weakening of environmental regulation in the country. The, the problem is, is, is well notorious and we can see by satellite images, the expansion of land grabbing, logging and fires which are factors that lead to forest degradation, deforestation, and especially the expansion of the arc of deforestation to preserve forest lands, which is a great problem when we analyze the production of rains, which is used for the agricultural sector, especially in the Cerrado biome, including in the Mato Grosso state, Paraná state, Goiás State, Minas Gerais State, São Paulo State, Rio Grande do Sul State, Santa Catarina State, Mato Grosso do Sul State. These regions are benefited from the rain produced in this region of Amacro. Not only Amacro, but totally Amazonia, but this region, the western region of Amazonia, is a great region for producing rains, to produce the rain which is used for the agricultural sector. Well, and we can see in this figure that deforestation is increasing in a higher pace in this region. This region is very important. We will remember the, 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 uh, what I talked before, that the production of rain is con constantly in this region. The deforestation is increasing, increasing a pace which is enormous for the region, which is related to infrastructure, the roads, which is related to the perspective to include a biocyanic route, in this region to uh, grow the, the production, the, the produce the flow to the production to the Pacific Ocean, which is uh, an interest for, for analyzing this area. Uh, deforestation related to logging, deforestation related to fires, and deforestation related to the expansion of a model, a, a, a devised model with the, the mischaracterization of public areas, deforestation purely. We can observe this in the, this moment uh, at a macro, which is related, including with land use conversion. Land use conversion is occurring in, the, in this region, uh, in this case of the, this figure from 2012 to 2020, 5% of the Abuna Madeira SDZ, a macro area, suffered conversion from forest formations to anthropogenic land uses, mostly pasture, 78% to pasture. So, well, the conversion is occurring, the land use conversion is occurring uh, uh, following the higher pace of deforestation. In this scenario, uh, uh, maintain this region as a notable, notable deforestation hotspot like traditional deforestation hotspots of the Amazonia, the southeastern Pará and the upper Xingu River Basin. And what is the problem of the increasing deforestation in this region? Most of the Brazilian crop producer regions are directly influenced by the rain produced in the Amazon rainforest, well, especially in this region, the western region of the Amazon. In this case, a mere definition of zones without social environmental impact assessments and public policies related to the, the save of the forest, the extending forest, the population, the traditional population can trigger more setbacks than advance for the agro-environmental sector. Well, uh, land grabbers in the region are potentially clearing, subdividing, and occupying this region and mischaracterizing protected areas as real estate after the announcement of the intention to create this zone. Part of this is related to speculation, to economic land prices of the, the land. Part is related to <clears throat> political incentives, related to the rhetoric of the, the past Brazilian federal government. 
part is related to the expansion of a model which is obsolete at this moment and when we consider that the standing force is, is também plurivalue we, uh, is well plurivalue e uh, should be be um, uh, potentialized in the region should be productized in this region in concluding the the analysis we can can talk about the contrary uh, to economic development the mercuration of a sustainable development zone which which not have uh, characteristics of sustainability and not have characteristics of development can trigger socioeconomic losses affect essential EBITDA for climatic conditions for agricultural environment and activity the agricultural the agro livestock activity uh, which can uh, turn uh, turn the this region an obsolete region not only for the agricultural production but for the environmental protection considering that the time to to reforest recondition de this 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 land uh, the regional environmental and socioeconomic potential is at this moment under exploited in exchange for a deceptive Eldorado in this moment in the Amazon. Not only in the Amazon, when we consider the, the Brazilian scenario, but especially in the Amazon, despite the reduction of deforestation at the, the, the last year, and environmental impact studies are exclusively needed to be concluded before establishing a macro, establishing this zone for agricultural development, agro stock development. We can observe that this, this type of analysis uh, depends on uh, exclusively environmental impact studies regarding the potential of the region. We can observe that this region uh, is uh, a portent of region in Brazil that we, we, we are affecting, we are analyzing that this will be affected. To ensure the rightly expected turn on conservation policies, the Brazilian federal government will need science-based law enforcement measures and strategies to curb the spread of deforestation, especially the spread of deforestation, including territorial ordering, territorial ordering, land tenure regularization, systemic and multi-sectoral land tenure regularization, stimulating sustainable agro stock, and uh, avoiding um, avoiding an ecatomb, a regional ecatomb with uh, international consequence. If Brazil adopts a model uh, related to science-based information, territorial planning and ordering territorial ordering this type of problem will be eradicated because we can observe the zoning the importance of the zoning and the importance of of the, the analysis for, for different types of combination of data integrating data thank you for for your attention i acknowledge uh, unesp the Faculdade de Ciências e Engenharia de Tupã, School of Sciences and Engineering Tupã, the Group de Estudo de Inovação, Tecnologia e Sustentabilidade, Innovation, Technology and Sustentabilidade, and the São Paulo Research Foundation, FAPESP. Thank you.